Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics, we'll sit down with business leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And today we're going to take a deep dive into all things Board of Directors. How do you get on a board? How to quickly come up to speed on the company once you've landed that board spot? And what makes for a great board member? To help us answer these questions and more is Harry Kramer. Harry is the Professor of Management and Strategy at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, my alma mater where he teaches in the MBA and the executive MBA program. He's also an executive partner with Madison Dearborn Partners, one of the largest private equity firms in the country. And he's the former chairman and CEO of Baxter International, a large global healthcare company. Harry, welcome to the program. Great to be with you, Steve. So Harry, boards of directors, you know, what, you know, just do an overview for our listeners. What are all the different kinds of organizations that have boards and then how are you know, different organizational boards the same and how do they differ? Yeah, it's, it's a great way to start, Steve. I mean, as you said, there are all kinds. So you've got uh, c- companies that are publicly traded. You have companies that are private, that may be owned by an individual, may be owned by private equity. Uh, and then you've got nonprofits. Uh, and in every one of those cases, you've got a group of people uh, that have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to really govern the organization. But as you can imagine, it's very, very different uh, for a publicly traded company that has a stock price and you constantly have to be thinking about what's best for the shareholders. At the same time, you're performing good governance and dealing with the ethics. Whereas in a nonprofit, you know, you may not be focused on any kind of stock price, but you do have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to make sure that the nonprofit organization is carrying out the, the governance charter that it's set. So, you know, in, in, in a multi-stakeholder world, I guess one way to think about it would be that for-profit organizations have owners, whether they're, whether, you know, it's a public company with shareholders or a private company, and not-for-profits do not have owners, but they have um, a duty to society, I, I guess. And so the boards function a little bit differently because of that, right? Well said, well said, well said. And when you think about a nonprofit, yes, you don't have owners, but obviously you in some cases have significant donors that are expecting you to utilize the funds they provided you uh, in the most efficient way to take care of the needs for the nonprofit goals. And, and, and then you always have this, this um, oversight um, accountability with the board. But the management is accountable for running the company. And, and sometimes there's tension there. It, it describe what the duties are of the board vis-a-vis management in terms of running the company. Yeah, it's a great one, Steve. And as you and I know from both you and I being on boards, uh, it, it can be kind of a little bit of a sensitivity as well. And the advice I got on this one uh, from Mr. Graham, who was the founder of Baxter, early on, he basically taught me, he said, you know what, Harry, it's actually pretty simple. Okay, management manages and boards govern. And as long as people know what their role is, this works out really well. Where it gets a little dangerous is when boards think they're involved in management or management is weak enough, they let the board get involved in things other than governance. And I think that ability to think through what should a board be focused on? And as you and I know, they should be focused on governance. They should be focused on representing and having a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. They should be constantly thinking through and assessing, is this CEO, is this man or woman who's running the company capable of performing what we need as a board in our responsibility? And as you know, Steve, one of the greatest responsibilities of a board is CEO succession. You know, the the CEO, he or she may have some ideas on who the successor ought to be. He can provide ideas, but the responsibility for CEO succession rests with the board. Yeah, and, and really all of the legal accountability, if you will, rests with the board. And, and then it's delegated to the CEO and others in the organization. And that's where the oversight comes in, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So if how do you um how do you uh, characterize the duties of a board member? So when I think about being a board member, 
I think of it literally as I go on a board, I have a responsibility to the shareholders to make sure that we have good governance, that the ethics is being taken care of, that we're doing things that are in line with what a shareholder would expect, focused on trying to make sure that we are generating return for the shareholder. At the same time, we're being socially responsible, we're being ethical, and we're performing our duties. Yeah, and that's a real that, that's a real easy to understand uh, explanation. You know, th there's also the the sort of the legal definition, which is duties of care, loyalty, and good faith. What does that actually mean in practice? Yeah, I, I sort of view it as when I'm a board member, I have a responsibility to follow exactly what you just said. I need to use my best business judgment to try to make decisions that are in the best interest of the company. And this whole concept of you don't show up at a board and don't read the material. You don't try to wing it and act like you know what's going on and not asking a lot of questions or challenging. You show up well prepared. You understand what the issues are. You understand what the mission and vision of the company is. And you're making sure that you're asking questions. You're doing it in a respectful way. But you are literally a fiduciary responsible to the people who own the company. Yeah, and then the law gives the board, you know, great latitude within that to operate, and you, you use the term business judgment, um, and that's that's sort of used as the uh, the headline, the business judgment rule. But the, it, you know, the board has great latitude to to really do what they think is best for the company, right? Absolutely, yeah. And and you, as you said, that you often hear about this business judgment. Well, what does that really mean? That doesn't mean you're going to make all the right decisions. That doesn't mean that sometimes you're not going to make a, a mistake. You know, a board may decide we're going to buy this company for $200 million. Uh, and it may turn out due to some other circumstances, it may not have been worth $200 million. And it could have been a mistake. But if you and I are on that board, are we diligent? Are we asking good questions? Are we using the best judgment we have at that time to make a decision that we think is in the best interest of the company and, and the shareholders? Right. So now turning to the to the board members themselves, you know, what qualifies, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of characteristics of board members, which, are, you know, we'll get into in a minute. But what what are the technical qualifications of a board member? There are, you know, for public companies, I know that there are listing standards and SEC requirements and so forth. But how do you characterize them? Yeah. So I characterize for the most part of putting people on a board that, to your point, have good business judgment, that are people that really are willing to spend the time and the quality of time to be as responsible as need to be. And then as you know, Steve, depending on the committees they're on, it can get more specific. You know, to be on an audit committee, at least there needs to be one or two people uh, that have uh, are considered a financial expert. There's somebody who literally uh, is knowledgeable enough that when they're looking at the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow, they're reasonable and can ask sophisticated questions to make sure that the company is on course to do what they said they're going to do. Yeah, so there's some requirement of financial literacy. They have to have some knowledge of leadership and, you know, it. but it doesn't mean that they necessarily had to be a CEO. They could be leaders in other ways, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. For the most part, to your point, they have, they have proven leadership skills that they can bring to the benefit of the company and to the shareholders. Yeah, now, so you were chairman and CEO of, uh, you know, a magnificent company, Baxter International, big global company. You know, when, when you look back at, you know, your best board members, you know, how would you describe them? Sure. I would say the best board members are people that literally come to the meeting prepared. They ask good questions. They're challenging. They're people who clearly are looking for the best interest of the company. And to the extent that they've got a broad business background, even if they've been in a different industry, Steve, even if they don't have experience in that particular company, do they have the breadth of knowledge to be able to look at uh, things in an overall global perspective? I, I often will tease the Kellogg students. Um, I'll say, well, sometimes you're running into people. They're very, very good, but uh, they get lost in the trees and they don't see the forest. And I'll tease people, Steve, that there are some people, unfortunately, who never get to the trees, right? They're in the root system. And I think a good board member has to be able to get from the roots to the trees to the forest. How does this whole thing fit together? 
Why are we in these divisions and not those? Why are we in these geographies and not those? How are we dealing with competition? How are we dealing with innovation? So I almost think of it, Steve, the ability to get out of a, a silo and to be able to look holistically at the total company and the industry and the competition. Yeah, and at the same time, you know, it it's a team, uh, you know, with the board and the management group, and and so there has to, even though there's this the oversight accountability and the challenging and the questioning, at the end of the day, there has to be a level of collegiality, and and there can only be one plan, right? So there has to be some some level of consensus that people are willing to get to, and that's a that's a unique characteristic as well. Steve, that is so important, and it's it's great you brought that up. So. First, I look at the at the technical intelligence level, experience level, right? And then we move to very, very important what you're saying, which is, well, I'll tell you this one. I tease people sometimes. If you go back to your kindergarten report card, Steve, and it literally said, now that's Steve guy, does he work well and play well with others on his kindergarten report card? These are people that better be able to work well and play well with others. You know, you don't want people that need to be the smartest person in the room. You don't want people who literally uh, suck up all the oxygen. These are people on a meeting that said, well, wait a minute, I may have a view, but but Steve, what do you think? Joe, what do you think? Mary, what do you think? It, you, you're dealing with people that have collaboration. These are people that they don't have to be right as a team in a collegial way. They're trying to make sure we're doing the right thing, not being right. It's not an ego game. That's right. And, and you can't have multiple plans because at the end of the day, a company can only, you know, can only go in one direction. And so, you know, after you're finished challenging and going through the, you know, the debate and, and the suggestions, you, you do have to be able to align. And that's really hard for some people. It really is. It really is. In fact, uh, again, I always, when I'm serious, I always try to have a sense of humor, Steve. So <laughs> I, I often advise people when they're putting somebody on a board, I'll say, well, make sure the person you put on the board that they no longer need to be the guy. And when I say the guy, it's a gender neutral term, the man or woman, because they're no longer the CEO. And so the example I would give, Steve, is if you're the CEO and I'm a board member and you say, hey, I'm going to launch this product in, in Mexico. And I say, well, hey, Steve, you know, I ran a multi-billion dollar business in Latin America. I, I think you really ought to do it in Argentina. Now, I tell you why you think about it or whatever. And if your decision is, I've thought a lot about it. I've listened to all of you, but I, I want to do it in Mexico. What's my reaction? Well, the good reaction is, hey, Steve, you know what? You've made the decision. Here's three people that used to work with me at Baxter who I think could really help you. The bad situation yeah. is when I say, Steve, if I not spoken English, uh, you met, I, I told you, I told you Argentina. OK, but wait a minute. No, I'm not the CEO. You're the CEO. OK, right. so, if, so if it's a business judgment question, you, in my mind, is the operational person is management. You know, you're running the company. We're not running the company. And that's a big distinction. The boards don't run the company. They, they advise and they, and they give oversight. Now, you're also on the boards. Uh, you're, you're involved with uh, Madison Dearborn, which is one of the largest private equity companies in the, in the world. Um, and so you're on some private boards too. How does a portfolio company of a private equity organization, how, how is that board different than say a public company board? Yeah, it's it's been fascinating, Stephen. I, I find there's a there's a pleasure and a, a benefit of being on both types. We talk quite a bit about what the public board is like. Uh, for a, a, a portfolio company of a private equity company, as you know, Steve, first of all, it's private. OK, so you're dealing right up front with you're not dealing with this quarter to quarter thing. OK, you literally make an investment. In fact, the best way I would describe this whole private equity model, Chief, is, you know, if we buy a company for two hundred million dollars. The entire focus of the board is how do we work with management to help this value go from 100 million to 200 million? What does that look like? What's required to do that in an ethical way? And at the end of the day, we're not going to spend time worrying about a quarter. We're very focused on what needs to happen over the next five years in order to achieve that. But I would say, as you well know, a lot of well run private equity companies usually try to include most of the things that are done in a public company, because after a four or five year period of time, there's a reasonable chance the company could go public. And if the market timing looks good and you want to take it public, you don't want to say, oh, well, we don't have uh, an audit committee. We don't have this. We're going to have to wait six months. No, you want to be all set to flip the switch and become a public company if that opportunity exists. And so therefore, 
most of the governance principles and practices that you see in a public company are also implemented in a private organization for that reason. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, Steve, as you well know, may be different than a private company that's not part of a private equity, because if you're the sole proprietor and you own the company with your children and your intention is to always keep it private, what you do in governance could be far different if, if, you, own the, if you own the whole company. Yeah, it's fascinating. So we've talked about the different types of boards, the responsibilities and qualifications of a board member and how to go about getting on a board. We're going to talk about next with Harry about the, the do's and don'ts. We're going to take a short break and be right back. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world? And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Board of Directors expert, Harry Kramer, who is the professor at Northwestern University's Kellogg School. Um, Harry, you know, we were just talking about uh, the various kinds of boards and so forth. If you were to advise people, you know, who say, hey, I think I could do that, Harry, how, how would you advise them to go about getting on a board? Yeah, this is a great one, Steve, and, and I'm sure that your case as well. I get a lot of colleagues that will have friends that will ask that question. And, and here's a couple perspectives. Number one, assuming, big assumption, I think that the person is qualified, that they build up a lot of the discussion, a lot of the skill sets that you and I are talking about. A, a couple approaches. One approach, I think, is to really use your network. You know, who are people that you've worked with in the past, maybe gone to school with in the past? that you've had a good relationship with, that they know you, the kind of person you are, the personal characteristics, the professional characteristics, and, and having that network uh, that could actually help you uh, get an invitation to possibly being considered for a board. And I would argue the wider the network, and this is obviously easier now with, than when you and I were growing up, Steve, because now you can get on LinkedIn, find out who are the persons right. you went to Kellogg with, or Booth, or Harvard, State, whatever, and you've you got that group of people and you found out where they are, well, some of them may be running companies. Some of them may be on other boards. And the network, I think, is one. The other one that's interesting, Steve, I've realized and I've been advising people, is that, as you well know, to go from never being on a board to suddenly be on the, a board of a large publicly traded company, pretty tough to do because, of course, they're going to say, well, what's your board experience? It's, it's a little bit, Steve, like the first time you want to be a manager, they say, well, what's your managerial experience? I don't have any. That's why I want to be a manager. <laughs> and the, the, the way I thought about this one, Steve, is to literally work your way up. And what I mean by that is, interestingly enough, I advise people, well, first of all, maybe get on the board of a, of a nonprofit, maybe a small nonprofit. And they say, well, no, OK, Harry, I know I have a responsibility to do that, but I'd really like to be on the board of a publicly traded company. No, I know that. But first of all, if you get on the board of a small nonprofit, you know, maybe it's your local hospital or whatever, who are the people that are on that board? Well, often... They are the CEOs of small companies in that area. So if I show up and I'm doing a good job, I'm offering to do the strategic plan for the hospital, and you're there as a CEO of a small company, you may say, boy, boy this Harry Kramer is a pretty good guy. Hey, Harry, would you like to go on my board? So then all of a sudden now, I've gone from just being on a nonprofit to now I'm on Steve's you know, relatively small for-profit. Well, then I'm on yours. And who's on your board? Well, maybe it's a couple of people that are a publicly traded company board member. And then they say, well, boy, you know, uh, and so you bet you basically work your way up. And I have found that to be a very attractive way because you're proving you have some of the skill sets that you and I talked about earlier. Do you have the maturity? Do you have the collaboration? Are there certain areas of expertise you can bring to the party? And if you can do that, yeah, let's put that person on the board. And, and so what you're, what you're describing is, you know, not dissimilar to how you move up in an organization. You know, you start with a, a smaller task, a smaller board in this case. It's usually, you know, these not-for-profits are non-paid kinds of positions. 
Um, but every community has hospitals and schools and, uh, you know, lots of not-for-profits, you know, United Way has many divisions. So there, there are so many opportunities to do this and, and, you know, practice some of the skills, right? No, and Steve, it's so important because that's the other piece of this, right? If you've never been on a board and you're used to doing things on your own, to be on the, on the board of, of the local food depository or whatever, where you're forced, as you said earlier, Steve, to be working with 15 people, giving them a chance to talk, showing collaboration, working together where you're not the decision maker, but you've got to make that work. And as you hone those skills and you get good at it, you're the perfect person to move yourself up. Okay, so once a person now is on one of these boards, um, you know, and, and let's just keep it in the not-for-profit realm. Well, how do you recommend that people come up to speed on the company? Because just because you've been to a hospital doesn't mean that you know much about the operations of a hospital. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I've been on the board now for North Shore University Health System for many years. And boy, oh boy, it's a lot different than any company you and I have been associated with. And so I would say the following, Steve. Um, and by the way, some organizations are good enough that if, as you well know, Steve, as you're coming on the board, they put together a, a training program for you where you will meet with the heads of the different departments or the heads of the different divisions. You'll spend time in the case of a hospital with the doctors in some of the different areas. You know, you'll spend a day or two walking around the hospital, understanding what it looks like, how it all works to get to get a knowledge base. Uh, I would then suggest uh, if it's a company that, you know, you definitely want to read the annual reports. Every time I go on the board, I'm sure you do, of a publicly traded company, I want to read the annual reports, the 10Ks. I want to talk to the management mm -hmm. team. And I want to know what people think about the company. And the beauty is, you know, Steve, of a public company, I can now get all the analyst reports. I can get everything that every major investment bank has said about this company. And if you listen to some of the transcripts, it's the best of all worlds, Steve, because you can get an understanding of what's the CEO and the CFO talking about the future direction of the company. And at the same time, you can get an understanding of what the shareholders, what are the security analysts uh, asking. So you get, again, you get that ability, in my language, to get from the roots to the trees to the forest, and you can put yourself together and understand how this all fits together. Because to your point, Steve, you're going on a board, you want to really, truly be able to add value, and you can't add much value if you don't really know what's going on. So you've described a sort of informal and formal onboarding. The informal part is what you can do on your own, and then... And, you know, in this world where everything's electronic, you don't have to move far from your computer in order to do that. Also social media, because, you, you know, see what uh, people are saying about the company. So that's sort of the informal. But you also describe this formal process. And, and that is meeting with the management and up and down, visiting um, the various facilities and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a and the company will help a, a prospective member with that as well, right? But, but there's some of it they can do on their own. You can do a tremendous amount on your own. And to your point, I, I, it's a nice balance. You're doing a lot of your own homework. You're finding out what people are saying about this company on Glassdoor and all every other of these social vehicles. And at the same time, a really good company is going to want to make sure that you meet with quite a few of the other people. And in fact, I would also say, Steve, before I want to go on a board, I like to meet with all of the board members. I'd like to understand what is this group I'm going to be spending a lot of time with? Uh, are these the kind of people I respect? Are they people willing to listen? And even with the CEO, is this CEO looking for people to come on the board that in a respectful way will challenge them? Or you and I know companies, Steve, where, you know, the CEO, I've got a board because I guess I have to have a board, but excuse me, I'd rather not listen to these people. And you want to know that before you get involved. Yeah. And, and particularly with early boards, you know, the, you have to be willing to learn. And that means learn about the organization, learn about the industry, learn about the the processes and so forth. How long do you think it takes once you're on a board to, to sort of get your sea legs? Boy, Steve, you know, that's a good question. Uh, part of the answer, I think, is it is it an industry that you know a lot about and have been in, or is it something that's relatively new to you and you don't know that much about? So, you know, several of the boards I'm on uh, are healthcare related and having been at Baxter and been in healthcare now for 40 years, you kind of know your way around. Uh, I've also been fortunate to be on the board of what started off as SAIC, Science Application International, uh, that now uh, we've split the company into two, and now it's Lidos, which is a, uh, a very, very sophisticated defense contractor uh, for the government. Well, I had no knowledge of that, and I would say it took me 
almost a year uh, to really get my arms around even the terminology, all the stuff that they're doing for Department of Defense and the FBI and uh, CIA and getting my head around that. Again, very it's a lot of fascinating new things, but to take the time to really learn that from the outside, it could definitely take me a year before I'm really adding much value. Yeah, and, and I, I've heard that so many times, you know, with a cadence that's a quarterly cadence or sometimes up to six times a year that the boards meet it, you know, it does take a few times and, and it takes a cycle, doesn't it, in order to, to, to learn it because it's, there's, there's typically a planning cycle and um, a scheduling cycle to these board meetings and you don't get, you don't get a full taste until you've been through a full cycle. Yeah, and that's really helpful, Steve. And in fact, you're absolutely right. I mean, most cycles, it literally go through, as you well know, you in, in, you have a major theme in each board meeting, right? So, you know, one board meeting may be very focused on the strategic plan. Another one may be very focused on the operational plan. Uh, a third one may be based on the people dynamics and what's the people succession planning look like for the top 20 or 30 people. You know, you may have uh, an investment a meeting that's focused on potential acquisitions, internal investments, right? So to your point, until you've gone through a full cycle of those four to six, it's not easy to get your arms around the total organization, particularly if you don't know much that much about the industry. So it sounds like it's a little bit like merging onto a freeway where you have to come up to speed on the on the ramp and find your spot and, and ease into traffic without causing a wreck. Uh, and, and then, you know, go with the flow for a bit as you learn things and, and, and then take it from there. I, it, I, it, that, maybe that's a, a, no, not a, I, a metaphor. I, 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 lo I love analogies. I'm big in analogy steel. I'm going to have to steal that one for Kellogg. That's a great <laughs> analogy. Okay. I've seen people come in on the entrance ramp and they blow up before they, they get going because they're, they're, they want to act like they know things. And then they come across looking like they have no idea what the heck they're talking about. So. Uh, yeah, the, that's you. You literally want to ease on. You want to listen. You want to, you know. I always use that uh, St. Francis quote: "I seek to understand before I'm understood." Okay, I seek to understand, and I think taking the time and demonstrate. You ask a lot of questions. Uh, you demonstrate that you care, uh, but you don't go running around like you know what's going on when you don't, because people see through that almost immediately. Yeah, and, and you don't want to be disruptive in your first few meetings by asking too many questions that may be too basic. But so. So, but, but, you know, I, I've seen some, some great onboarding where people, you know, do the work before they start, but, but then after each board meeting, they set up separate sessions and they, you know, they have meetings to try to say what, you know, so what was going on here? Why did this, which isn't disruptive to the full board, but then obviously moves things ahead for the individual. Well said, well said. Yeah. So we've talked about the individuals on a board, just Generally, what are some of the characteristics of a high-functioning board as a team? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And I, I'm smiling, Steve, because, and you're a Kellogg guy, we, we talk about this a lot, is to what is a team and what isn't a team, right? Mm -hmm. um, and part of the way I, I teach this, Steve, as I literally talk about what is a team? A team literally has a clear elevating goal, and every single person on the team knows what their role is. And so sometimes you'll hear, oh, a team. Well, you know, we're all supposed to get along and therefore we're not supposed to challenge one another. Well, no, no, we're definitely going to challenge one another, right? When you say we ought to go north, uh, if I say, well, wait a minute, I think we ought to go south. Well, let's talk about that. You know, Steve, why do you think it's north? And give us some understanding of that. And let me tell you why I made. So you want to make sure you're collaborative, but you're challenging. Uh, you, you're living the values of what you would expect people to do when they talk about really making sure that we're really working together, but we're challenging one another in a respectful way. So it's, you know, you're also uh, an expert at, at leadership and you teach a lot of leadership and, you know, there are different forms of leadership, you know, some is dictatorial, you know, where you know, the person says, I'll, I'll lead and everybody else follow and I don't want to hear about it. But that's not what a board is. What I hear you saying is it's more it's 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 leader. It's cross-functional leadership. It's it's collaborative leadership. It's and that's what the whole group, you know, the group dynamics come in. So leadership is important here, regardless of what role you are on the board. Absolutely, Steve. In fact, I I talk about as you well know, I talk about these four principles in a leader, and it's the same thing on a board. You know, uh, the importance of being self-reflective, being self-aware. Okay, uh, I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at having a balanced perspective. You know, I always tease, I did this on, this morning on the board, Steve, 
I don't know if you thought about this, when somebody often says, well, I don't understand where you're coming from. Often they don't want to understand. They're just letting you know they disagree. So this morning, somebody <laughs> said, so you know exactly what I'm talking about, Steve, but this morning, somebody, somebody said to me this morning, well, I don't understand where you're coming from. And I said, Joe, would you like to understand? Because if you'd like to understand, <laughs> I'm happy to explain it to you, right? And so I, I've, I've, actually, I've actually realized over time, Steve, that, that you know, if I'm having a discussion with you, I'm going to try to avoid saying I don't understand because in a way that's ignorant. If I take the time, I can understand. Then I'll decide, do I agree or disagree? And to your point, this whole idea of being self-reflective, developing a balanced perspective, having what I would call true self-confidence, being willing to say, hey, Steve, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. By the way, Steve, you know what? I was wrong. I think what Bill said makes more sense. Are you, do you have true self-confidence? And then the fourth one I always call, uh, Steve, genuine humility, where you realize every single person matters. And I always say genuine, because as you well know, Steve, a lot of people can act humble when you realize it's just a bunch of talk. And faking this, you look bad. But if, if you can have those four principles, I think you're going to be asked to be on boards. I think you're going to do well. And as you well know, Steve, it's a fantastic experience. Harry, this has been really terrific advice. Thanks for spending a little time with us today and sharing your experience and your advice for board members. Happy to do it and always a big fan of the conference board, Steve. I appreciate everything you and the whole team are doing. Thank you. And, and thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights into the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues, with your friends, with your classmates, with everybody in the neighborhood, because I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast and webcast have been brought to you by the Conference Board.